And welcome, everyone. It's great to see you. I am Duncan Hood with the uh, American Schooner Association and the Great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race. We are currently uh, on a distant site. There's been a massive power outage where I live, and our guest and I may be both experiencing all the smoke from Nova Scotia, which has blown all the way from Nova Scotia to Annapolis. Having said that, anyway, today's guest is Gordon Locko, and Gordon has a remarkable career. He is an historian. He is a film consultant, having consulted, I believe, is that right, Gordon, over 50 films? Is that correct? 64 now. Goodness gracious me. And uh, being a bit of a buff of the particular period that we are about to talk about in history, it's a very interesting time when France, after the what we call the French and Indian War, what the Canadians call the Seven Years War, ended France's domination of um, the New England area ended, and Canada went off on its own and did its thing. So we're going to be talking about the survey that was done in 1814. Is that correct, Gordon? Uh, 15 to 21. 1815 to 1821 that was conducted of the Upper Great Lakes. And um, Gordon's going to tell us a little bit about that. And with that, my friend, are you ready to do this? Well, I didn't hear that. Aye, aye. All right. It's the right thing to say. When you're ready, my friend, share the screen and away we go. Okay, here we go. And uh, I'm sure to fumble this, but here we go. Share screen. You're going to be awesome. There I am. How's that? And there you are. And I've got your screen and you are good to go, Gordon. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm just remembering uh, the first time I did a remote uh, webinar talk like this. I'd never done one before, uh, about a year before COVID. Uh, we were gearing up to start shooting the film Greyhound. And uh, my work permits when I come to the States are always very specific to the project I'm working on. And along came the Jane Austen Society that wanted to bring me to Kansas City to speak about the traditions of the Royal Navy, because, of course, Jane Austen's sisters or brothers were naval officers. And I didn't want to uh, 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 in any way endanger the terms of my work permit, so I told them I can't come. And they came up with the idea of having me FedEx my PowerPoint pictures to them on a computer chip, and then they connect me by telephone to speak in the auditorium. So they had a, a guy there hitting the advance key when I said advance, please. And my disembodied voice was uh, booming to 1,100 people of the Jane Austen Society's. Oh, more than that and corrects me. That is, that's so much better than live from Panera Bread. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I'd never done it before. So I was sitting in my little messy <laughs> office here, which I'll show you in a minute. And I, uh, I was... Uh, I was flabbergasted because I, I thought I'd start, uh, as I always do, by making a joke to try to make some kind of attachment to my audience. So I put up a picture of Admiral Lord Cochrane in his later years. He was a contemporary of Nelson's uh, in Jack Aubrey's from the fictional series of Master and Commander. And he lived long enough to be photographed when he was very old and crusty looking and wearing about 40 pounds of medals on his chest. Nice. So I said, I'm glad to be here as a disembodied voice. Here I am. So you know what it looked like. And I put that picture up. <laughs> and I don't know what I expected, but there was silence. And I, and I froze. I thought, oh, my God, they don't get the joke. And the, my, my uh, iPhone beeped. And the kid that was running the projector realized why I froze. And he texted me, they are laughing. Oh, so, thank God. That's... Away, away I went. And the funny thing is now we do these every week. So uh, away we go. It's just so, a... uh, uh, That's me in the picture uh, uh, at Quebec City. And it's got nothing to do with the talk, but I guess it's a nice picture of me. The vessel in the background is the Bark Picton Castle, uh, uh, which is based in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. She's just left on a uh, long delayed round the world expedition with a crew of very yeah. eager sailors. When that photograph was taken, uh, she was arriving in Quebec City after coming over from France to do a reality TV show for the CBC. That's the uh, Canadian Broadcasting System. 
uh, corporation. And what we did was we took a dozen Quebecois, French Canadians, whose ancestors came from France before the conquest in the Seven Years' War, or French and Indian War, before England took Canada from France, and which, also, which is almost everybody with a French name in Quebec. And we sent them back to the villages they came from. We chose people we could do the, the genealogical research on, had them walk or ride donkeys uh, down to La Rochelle and board a ship and come across to the New World. The, sh the show was called The Great Crossing or La Grande Traverse. And we filmed them in reality show style while they were coming across the Atlantic Ocean. One of them said they'd never set foot on any kind of boat again. Two of them became devoted tall ship sailors. Uh, there were a couple of romances, and it was turned out to be a very moving television show, especially the arrival when they were imagining their their very ancestors oh. in uh, the late 1740s yeah, coming the, across. What was the name of that show again, Gordon? Uh, La Grande Traversie. I'll uh, I'll give it to you later uh, so you can look it up. Uh, you've got to speak French to see it, although I think there is a version with subtitles. So anyway, that's me. And uh, by way of introduction, uh, I'm sitting right now in my little office, which is in an appendage of my old brick house here in Midland, Ontario, on the upper Great Lakes. And uh, as you'll learn in the next uh, few minutes, uh, that this is an area whose history uh, interests me deeply, and I, I hope interests you somewhat too. Okay. Uh, All right, here we go. Here we go. The uh, main thrust of my, uh, my business affairs is uh, what we call G.H. Laco and Son. Until a short while ago, it was G.H. Laco and Associates. And to be perfectly honest, my associates were my left and right hands usually. Uh, we, uh, my sons joined me and in the picture on the right, you can see Rob standing beside me and we're both looking with horror at the rotten foot of a mast on a schooner that we, we, uh, we downrigged last fall. Uh, together, we are North American suppliers for traditional rope blocks, rigging and fittings. I uh, won't go through the whole list, but what I tell my friends is that if what you're looking for is heavy and obsolete. That's my thing. Uh, the gear we sell is all new. A lot of it is specially made for vessels, especially for historic sites. And uh, uh, that's that's what we do. We're also the Canadian national importers for Epiphanous yacht coatings. And uh, as uh, as Duncan said, uh, we serve as uh, historic consultants and technical advisors to films and documentaries. We've done quite a few of them. Some that I'm extremely proud of, some where I just held my nose and took the money. <laughs> we're not, we're not going to talk about those. <laughs> well, you can ask me if you like. I mean, I'll answer. I use this photograph that a friend snapped of us uh, sailing one day, and that's my, that's my own boat. And since you folks, a lot of you are in the Chesapeake, you know there's still a fleet of Elberg 30s there. Uh, I have an Elberg 30. Uh, my late uncle, Con Costas, uh, probably built my mast back in the 60s when he was the spar maker for Whitby Boatworks who uh, built those boats. But I like that picture because, well, that's me and my family sailing in our boat. Uh, that's our, our paint on the top sides. And on the bowsprit in the, in the foreground, uh, that's our varnish and those are my blocks and rope. Uh, the vessel is uh, a uh, historic replica from the state of Michigan called Friends Goodwill. Isn't that a great name for a warship from the mm -hmm. War of 1812? Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, I came uh, by a circuitous route to be to do what I'm doing when I was discussing with my son Rob uh, what his career aspirations might be. He said to me, you're doing what you've always wanted to do. And I said to him, geez, Rob, I never knew it would turn out this way. But I, I suppose I'm fortunate that it did. I've been in the marine supply business, mostly from the originally from the retail end, later from wholesale and importing since high school days. I served uh, some years as executive director of uh, one of North America's, uh, well, actually they are North America's second oldest sail training organization, Toronto Brigantine, operators of Pathfinder and Playfair, a couple of uh, steel square riggers. I was very pleased to uh, be invited to be co-founder of Atlantic Challenge Canada back in the 90s. I was captain of HMSB, uh, the government of Ontario's replica schooner gunboat from the War of 1812 era. We're going to talk a lot about her tonight. And for 11 years, I was a naval officer in the Royal Canadian Navy. That's a whole story in itself. Uh, after we made Master and Commander, I was on the circuit doing talks promoting the film. And the Navy uh, discovered me. And after uh, a session doing pictures and slides of how we shot the film, 
the commanding officer of the uh, Toronto Naval Reserve Division uh, stood up and said, thank you very much, Gordon. Very interesting talk. My wife's been talking to your wife. I know two things about you now that I didn't know before. He said, one is, I know that you wished you joined the Navy when you were in university when you should have 30 years ago. <laughs> and the other thing I know is your age. At that point, I just turned 50. He said, you're not quite too old, particularly as you have a particular skill that we're interested in, my uh, my uh, uh, tr uh, traditional seamanship knowledge. If you want to go for a commission, we'll support it. Oh, that's so wonderful. Uh, that, yeah, that spring, I commented to uh, my wife uh, as the as my, my business practices were taking off. I said, geez, Carolina, I guess this is success. And uh, <laughs> then uh, she nodded her head and I said, it just seems like a hell of a lot of work. And she said, this year, you should do something you've always wanted to do. And we talked about a sailing expedition down south. We talked about maybe uh, go back to graduate school for a, a higher degree. That night, I decided to join the Navy. And I was oh 50 goodness. years old. I was the oldest person to survive officer's basic for quite some time. That's another story. We'll tell that another time if you oh, want. I love it. What a great story, Gordon. So, um, like everybody in this uh, in this uh, in this sphere, I guess we're in. I don't know if I should call it a room. We've all got long roots in loving uh, vessels, and this is a piece of paper off a desk pad that my I found among my mother's effects when she passed away, and we were clearing up her stuff. It the date is nineteen July nineteen fifty eight. And uh, you can see in the top corner there, and I'll try that, oops, back we go. Ah, sorry guys. Um, I, Duncan taught me how there to There you go, it. there you go. Right there, you see a sailing ship, two rows of gun ports, masts, ratlins. On the back of that piece of paper, my mom wrote, drawn by Gordy, age two years, two months. So I guess, I don't know about you folks, but in my case, I guess it started early. And I tell people sometimes I thought I was a sailor long before I was one. And that must have made me pretty damn tough to put up with sometimes. Great. So Thank you. let's talk about history a little bit. And um, friends, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw some uh, nuggets of ideas down on the table or on the deck in, uh, between us. And I think some of them will be startling to you because we're talking about uh, historical events that have a lot to do with the national pride of both your country and mine. But I'm going to talk about them from the viewpoint of north of the border. And I don't mean to offend, but I do mean to startle. And if it provokes a discussion, that's the best possible way to look at history. So if someone were alive in the later 1700s and early 1800s, they were living in a war, in a world rather, that had been experiencing what by any definition was a world war that had lasted for three generations. It was perpetual, it was continuous. Uh, there were some small adjustments in who was fighting who, but basically it was England versus France for three generations. The battles in Europe were cataclysms uh, that were not equaled anywhere until the American Civil War and World War I came along. It was pretty big stuff in those days. It was something that touched everyone's lives. There was no part of the globe they weren't fighting on or fighting over. Here in North America, there was fighting too, but it was pretty much a sideshow the whole time compared to what was going on in Europe. The New England colonists, as Duncan said in the introduction, were feeling uh, quite threatened, actually. They were physically threatened by the French-Canadian colonists who were encouraging down from the north, from Quebec on them. They clamored for a campaign to clear France out of North America. Britain complied, and that campaign, which is I know is the US is called the French and Indian War, was just a sideshow of the Seven Years' War, and it was successful. France was defeated, their government left, uh, the hierarchy, the upper hierarchy of the colony left, the habitants, as they called themselves, the Canadiens, uh, stayed, and uh, Basically, uh, Quebec became part of the uh, the British Empire at that point, along with the American colonies. Interesting mm -hmm. side note, just a, a, 10 years earlier, when the uh, English cleared the uh, the French or the, uh, the Acadians, as they called themselves, out of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, they committed a genocide on them. They forced them to leave. They burned their farms. Uh, they became the Cajuns of Louisiana when they fled there. Many fled back to France. But 10 years later, when they took Quebec, they didn't do that. 
they had a completely different attitude towards the uh, the conquered territory they'd just taken. And basically, they told the French, pay your taxes, obey our laws, keep your religion, keep your legal system, and we'll leave you alone. So that is why we still have a French uh, culture in, in, in Quebec and Canada. So, hey, Gordon, I'm going to put yes. on just a sec, just for a little bit of housekeeping. Folks, as you get going, we've got a chat window open. And as you have questions, just put them in the chat window and we'll loop back to them as we uh, as we get toward the end. Having said that, thank you, Gordon. Back to yeah, you. Good point. I, and I do enjoy the, the Q and A's at the end the best. So please uh, take notes and leap all over me when we get to the end. So uh, seven years war is over. Uh, uh, brief peace reigns in the, in the in the world. Britain levied a tax on the colonies to pay for the war in North America that they fought on behalf of the colonists. It was a tax mostly on luxury goods. The colonists didn't like that very much. They began clamoring for direct representation in Parliament in England, and that was the seeds of the American Revolution. Uh, the cry was originally our rights as Englishmen, which was to be represented when, when laws and taxes were being levied on them. It later spun into a, a, a war for independence. Now here in Canada uh, and elsewhere in the world, we don't look at the American Revolution as the American colonists versus the British. Uh, historians have pretty clearly delineated that about one third of the colonists were energetically fighting for independence. About one third were fighting them equally energetically against it. And about one third, the remaining third, were hoping the war didn't affect their lives and their families. Britain was supporting the ones that were loyal. So we don't see that as Britain versus America. We see it as Americans fighting Americans who didn't want independence and Britain supporting the, the ones who were, who, were, uh, who were loyal. In the States, July 4th, as you know better than I, 1776 is celebrated as the Declaration of Independence, a monumental moment in history. However, that independence wasn't achieved for the better part of 10 years of bitter fighting after that. So I, I sometimes wonder why they've uh, chosen that particular date and not the date when they were finally successful. But it was a long drawn out war. And by any definition, as I've said before, in other terms, it was a civil war of, uh, of families basically fighting families and uh, regions fighting regions within the colonies. When the war was lost, there was an exodus of loyalists who didn't want to stay under the new republic. That made Canada an English speaking country. And that's startling for some people to realize, but before that, the English-speaking population in Canada was less than 10%. After the war, it was nearly half and very quickly superseded the French, uh, the French-speaking contention in the country. All that is important to this talk. I am going to get to what the title was referring to, because 30 years later, when uh, war was again sweeping the globe, and we called out those the Napoleonic Wars or the Great Wars. In the, uh, as we come close to 1812, war was again developing in North America. Most popular histories today label the causes of the War of 1812 to British, uh, the British stopping American ships, pulling seamen off them they deemed were deserters and free trade uh, in, uh, 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 instrument and so forth. The facts are that those issues were all resolved before the U.S. declared war. The actual declaration of war reads to take Canada and complete the work of the revolution. Is that right? That's what it says. And Thomas Jefferson added a proviso in a letter saying he thought it would be a mere matter of marching, and they hoped to take the country, take the land, before Britain could react, because any possible help had to come across the Atlantic. And okay. besides that, Britain was busy fighting battles like in the picture that's up on the screen right now. They were desperately fighting for their own survival. And the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the U.S. government hoped that they could achieve their aims before Britain could react and send help. That war uh, for us is uh, taught in our history as Canada's war for independence from the U.S., there were, uh, uh, I won't go into a lot of detail about what happened in it, except as it pertains to the uh, mapping of the Upper Great Lakes, and we are getting to that. There were- a, um, a, as That's the, uh, 
what we call the War of 1812, you consider your war of independence. That's correct. Wow. So uh, there were uh, a number of absolutely remarkable individuals, and I'm going to talk about one of them because he seemed to be everywhere during the war. Uh, his name was Lieutenant Robert Livingston. He came to Canada uh, about 1805 as a midshipman in the Royal Navy. For some reason we don't know, he left the Navy in Halifax and traveled inland to Sault Ste. Marie, where he became a small-time fur trader contracting to the Northwest Fur Company. They were competing with the Hudson's Bay Company. He, uh, in the course of his work, he became fluent in various uh, uh, native languages. And because business wasn't so good, he, he took a commission in the what was called the Indian Department, which was basically made him a part-time officer acting as liaison with the tribes. And there was no war happening yet, but it was something the British were always uh, uh, interested in cultivating so that if there was trouble, they would they would have allies. Nobody knows what Livingston looked like. Uh, the painting on the left is uh, an officer in the Indian Department. So we know they wore red, uh, uh, red tunics, gray, gray woolen pants with green facings on the tunic. They often in the field wore uh, non-regulation hats. But I think that's probably how Livingston dressed when he was in town visiting his boss. The picture on the right is probably more what he looked like when he was working. He was an absolutely remarkable nice. man. And I'm going to follow his travels a little bit here because it highlights why it became imperative to the Royal Navy to chart the Upper Great Lakes. That's an aerial photograph of the lake. Uh, people in Livingston's time in 1812, of course, didn't have the benefit of that. But the Great Lakes Basin was the, was the seat of the War of 1812. There were actions at sea and off the New England coasts but the vast majority of the fighting happened in land crossings there or on the waters of the Great Lakes. And incidentally, just in case anybody's curious and get my little pen going again here, at this moment, I am sitting right here in the town of Midland on the lower lobe of Georgian Bay. When the war news that the war was declared came, Livingston was at at his trading facility at St. Joseph's Island here. And a remarkable thing happened. The American government declared war on Britain. They sent the, the, uh, the, the appropriate paperwork to Montreal, which was the capital of British North America and Canada, and to London. But they didn't tell their outposts in the West. So when news got to Montreal that the war was declared, they immediately sent messengers, messengers west, hoping to get the news there before the Americans warned their own people that they had declared war on us. Yeah, it's a different sort of world, isn't it? So Livingston uh, was sent in a canoe, and they traveled uh, uh, by the route from Montreal, that's behind the picture, but through the lakes, through Lake Nipissing, down the French River to Georgian Bay, through the North Channel, past his home at St. Joseph's Island, to the British fortress just over here on, on our side of the border. And he told the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, who were garrisoned there, war had been declared, and they realized the Americans didn't know that yet. So they immediately mounted an expedition. They went and they took Fort Michilimackinac, which is now a holiday island, but they took the place. Uh, that was a quite, quite, quite a beginning. With prisoners and the news, Livingston traveled down to Detroit to meet General Isaac Brock, who was the military governor of Upper Canada told him the news that the, that the fortress at the top of the lake had been secured, came back up the lake, also by canoe, in a remarkably short period of time, to bring Brock's orders. He carried the response to time, Colonel... At this Sorry? time, Detroit was not part of the United States? Michigan was not part of the United States? Well, it was part of the United States. In fact, there was an American army there uh, under, uh, under command of a general who attempted a crossing of the river to what is now Windsor, Ontario, yeah, they were, they were repulsed, and Brock came down Lake Erie with uh, a 41st Regiment of Foot, several hundred Mohawk warriors, and they besieged the Americans in Detroit, uh, in a fortress at what is now the city of Detroit. And he played a uh, a classic ruse where he had his men marching in a circle past a clearing, so that his few dozen red coated soldiers looked like hundreds, and he told the uh, the native warriors to make a hell of a lot of noise. And then he sent a message to the Americans saying, 
you better turn yourself in and surrender because once we start fighting, I can't control these guys. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but I love it. I love it. <laughs> the Americans surrendered. They found out too late that they had surrendered to a vastly inferior force. And the uh, the sad story of the general, and I'm sorry, because my hair is white. I've uh, forgotten his name, but I'll try to recover it before we finish this. He was taken as a prisoner back to Montreal, and uh, he had fought with distinction during the American Revolution, but he was really too old to have been sent to a wilderness outpost. He shouldn't have been there. And in the outpost was his daughter and his grandchildren. So fear of a massacre, of course, weighed heavily on him, and Brock knew that. They sent him back to the Americans with a letter saying, he'll do more for us on your side. That's pretty cruel. <laughs> oh, man, that's cool. He was, uh, he was court-martialed, uh, sentenced to be shot, but uh, President Madison commuted that to uh, re uh, to retirement. Wow. And it probably wasn't his fault. He shouldn't have been there at his age and with, uh, with the vulnerabilities that he had that were preyed upon. So anyway, that's a long answer to your question. Detroit was part of Michigan territory, which was part of America, but uh, they uh, 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 Brock took it, and that's where he was when the news came. So uh, back to why the Great Lakes are important for yeah. navigation. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. So there's another trip back up to Michilimackinac. Then he was sent down through the uh, 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 Georgian Bay route to for to York, which is uh, where Toronto is now carrying dispatches that's here and from there he was sent down to fort george in the niagara frontier where he participated in the savage fighting along the coast along the niagara river he was shot in the leg with uh the musket ball was in his thigh for the rest of his life lost an eye to a tomahawk and was oh. pierced through the shoulder by a lance god i hate when that happens captured in fort niagara which still stands if you ever care to visit there he escaped swam across the Niagara River and got back into action. They sent him back to Michilimackinac. Yeah. He came back to Fort Willow, which is here, where he participated in the fight uh, uh, in which HMS Nancy, the last British uh, warship on the Upper Lakes, uh, was, was burned or destroyed. We say we burned her. The Americans say they destroyed her with howitzer fire. I think it was probably both. But uh, he was there, and then he traveled by canoe back up to Fort Michilimackinac after evading the blockade, where he told the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, Colonel McDowell, that on the way by, he passed two American warships. And by the way, if you let him have 100 men and several boats, he'd go back and take them. He did. I love this guy. <laughs> so they sent him back to Montreal with the news of that success, that the Upper Lakes were secure again. And that's this route here to Montreal. And by that time, it's winter. He met General Proctor, who wrote a message back to the fort. They immediately sent him back. So he made that trip in, in, in two weeks by snowshoe, going back from Montreal to Michilimackinac again. In his own words, he described at one point, he didn't stop walking and running for three days because he knew he'd freeze to death if he stopped, but he made it alive. He stood at Colonel McDowell's desk at Michilimackinac here, watched McDowell read the message, write a response, left that afternoon back to Montreal. Good God. And, and delivered the message. <laughs> By the end of the war, he was a broken man in 1815. Uh, his wounds had never properly healed. He'd received a breath. That was important because uh, a, a captain's pension would let him retire. He was probably in his uh, mid-30s by then, but in very bad condition. And he wrote a letter in which he described all his journeys and everything he did. He traveled 10,000 miles by canoe and snowshoe and foot during the course of the war fought in every major land and sea battle of the Great Lakes Theater. And at the end uh, was with the Royal Newfoundland Regiment south of what is now Chicago, about to lay siege to what is now St. Louis, Missouri, hoping to meet the British army that was going to come up from New Orleans, which of course had been defeated. They didn't know that. And also the war was over. The uh, American defenders at St. Louis came rushing out with waving newspapers from Washington saying, stop, stop, please stop. The oh, war is man. over. I love that. And a great story. Livingston sat down 
Britain with uh, uh, with the, uh, the the officer commanding the uh, British troops that were there, and they had hundreds of of uh, Mohawk and Ojibwe warriors with them. Those warriors were fighting for a sovereign nation, which would have been what is now Michigan. They were going to give them the, give them the space between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron as their sovereign nation. Is that Livingston, right? Livingston knew that because Brock and Tecumseh were both dead, the men who'd made the agreement, and basically the great wars were now over, nobody wanted to defend the Indians, and that would come off the table. So what Livingston and the British officer in command uh, south of Chicago did was they threw a party to celebrate the end of the war. And while the warriors were celebrating, they left. And Livingston went back to the Sioux. The chief of the uh, warriors who was in on the scheme was a hermit for the rest of his life because he knew he couldn't face his people. So I'd say the only real losers in that war were the native people who fought so hard to defend Canada and never got what they'd hoped for. Yeah, and isn't that the, the case all through history? So what happened to Livingston? He wrote this letter. I've got co I, uh, this uh, this uh, scan I've got here is a copy of it. I have a version that's much easier to read that's been transcribed to type. He's begging for his promotion. He's describing these superhuman things he did for the native people and for the crown. It went to General Proctor for forwarding to England to confirm his promotion. It was co-signed, I've got that other page here, by all the leading men on both American and Canadian sides in those days. General Proctor pinned a note on the back that's still in the archives in Ottawa that said, this is a dangerous young man. We must not let him embarrass us again. And he didn't get the promotion. He oh, died in obscurity. Yeah, really? So what did he do? I think uh, just like uh, T.E. Lawrence, otherwise known as Lawrence of Arabia, I think after the war, he fought too hard for the promises to be kept and he became an embarrassment. So that's another story. In fact, someone like me perhaps is, uh, may complete a book he's writing on that on that man's life. But the uh, what we're really here to talk about is sailing historic ships and why the Great Lakes needed to be charted. There were savagely fought battles on the lakes you're probably well aware of. One of the great American victories of that war was the Battle of Lake Erie in 1814. It was the uh, last time before World War I that a British fleet was defeated by a fleet it was fighting when, uh, when uh, Lawrence's uh, squadron took the British squadron on, on the lake and basically threw the, uh, threw the defense of the country into jeopardy for a few months. We're very fortunate that we've got some of the ships that fought in that battle as reproductions today. You probably all know USS Niagara. That's her on the lower right. We are very looking yeah, to her. And HMS Detroit, which was the uh, the British Canadian flagship in that battle, she was named for the victory of the capture of Detroit, uh, uh, was taken in the fight. She has been rebuilt, and that's something not people know nowadays. Really? Uh, Where is she kept? I, well, it's a sad story, and an all too Canadian, I have to say. A committee started working on her 20 years ago. I did everything I could to help them. They built the steel hull. They got to the point where they were about to start furnishing her, and they went under. Oh. And, uh, a couple of patrons carried her obligations for several years and then came to me and said, Gord, can you find someone who can take her from us and finish her? Well, I called my friend, Captain Richard Bailey, who'd been operating Rose for many years, and he talked to his friends in uh, Rhode Island, and she is now finished in sales as the Oliver Hazard Perry. I'll be darned. I'll Does that turn the knife in the wound? Yeah, Oliver turns, Hazard Perry totally is the man who captured her. <laughs> totally turns the knife. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, we're, we're, we're proud that she's finished in sailing. Yeah. Uh, uh, but with the vessels we're going to talk about tonight, and here we are 30 minutes into this, and I'm finally getting to it, are uh, two of the vessels that served on the, in the Royal Navy on the, the Upper Great Lakes. The topsail schooner on the right is HMS Tecumseh, named for the great warrior chief. And the uh, lighter schooner on the left is HMS B. She was my command for five years. And in this what photograph... What time that must have been. Well, I loved her, and I still do. In fact, I was a boarder this morning, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, they were part of the Royal Navy squadron on the, on the lakes. Uh, the Americans did something... Uh, you're, well, I'm talking to Americans. Your government did something absolutely brilliant uh, at the end of the at the end of the War of 1812. 
Negotiators in Washington who realized the war was not going their way, several New England states were threatening to secede from the Union because of the blockade the Royal Navy was putting on them, and the uh, Admiral Cochrane's uh, incursions into the Chesapeake, which were done solely to show Washington they could strike anywhere whenever they wanted and hit and run, were showing them that trouble was brewing, particularly since the Duke of Wellington, uh, the, the great uh, general, had just defeated Napoleon for the second time at Waterloo. The great wars in Europe were over and Wellington and 40,000 seasoned troops were on their way to Canada to wind up the war here. Oh and the Americans didn't want that to happen, of course. Yeah. Canada had, uh, had preserved its border with 1,800 regular troops, about 2,000 uh, armed militia, and about 10,000 native forces as allies. 40,000 regular troops would have made a difference. So the Americans also realized that news was uh, traveling in diff uh, very slowly in those days, of course, they, they all knew that. They uh, offered to discuss peace and named Ghent in Belgium as the place where the treaty would be discussed to end the war. So the news the American negotiators were getting was coming straight from Washington to Ghent. The British news was coming from Montreal to London to Ghent. And they were getting the news about two weeks late. Yeah, you would think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the British negotiators didn't know that the tide was turning in North America. They were delighted to put the border back where it was. Nobody wanted to talk about a nation for the for the uh, for the Indians, and the peace was made, basically winding things up in pretty much the state they were in in 1812. And an interesting thing there is, if the war had not happened, Canada and the U.S. probably would have gradually and naturally become one nation by about 1825 or 1830. Yeah, that's American, interesting. You bet. Yeah. If the American Revolution hadn't happened. Canada and Britain probably would have naturally drifted towards a single entity by about 1800. And they, uh, as Britain was in the mood for granting independence to colonies or self-government in the middle 1800s, that probably would have happened as a natural course of action then. But what we've got from all that are these schooners. And that's really what I'm here to talk about now. And we'll talk about the, navig the charting too. So... Tecumseh uh, is a 175 ton schooner. She's uh, one of those two vessels that were uh, sketched back in 1815. They were launched just as the war ended, so they never fought. They were named for Tecumseh, the Indian chief. Nobody knows what he really looked like, although that painting was done with the advice of someone who had met him while he was alive. He's a guy that is one of those figures in histories, like Livingston, that uh, the, the reality of what he achieved uh, completely uh, out distanced anything fiction could could imagine. Tecumseh was a uh, was a farmer living in what is now Ohio, and he had a brother who was a drunk. The drunk brother went. I'm paraphrasing like crazy here, by the way. Uh, all I hope to do is spark uh, interest in people to crack pages and read books. The drunken brother went into a coma, and they thought he died. And this is all going to sound quite bi biblical, but it was recorded by the British Army's Indian Department officer who witnessed the events. He came to after they thought he'd died, and uh, they said, well, welcome back, mate. Where have you been? Ha ha. He said, well, I've been to see God, and God told me that I need to motivate my brother Tecumseh to stop being a simple farmer and become a warrior chief and unite all the tribes of North America because there's a war coming. That and he met story. Oh, my goodness gracious. He convinced Tecumseh to leave his family and his farm. And for several years together, they traveled up and down uh, North America from northern Ontario down to the Mississippi Gulf, uniting tribes in, uh, in a confederacy for the coming war. And one of the uh, unions or treaties that Tecumseh was able to achieve was with General Isaac Brock, who was a brilliant uh, a lieutenant, military lieutenant governor sent to Upper Canada, who knew war was coming and was quite eager to make a relationship with the First Nations. Livingston was at the meeting when they met. Tecumseh could speak English fluently. And when the two men met, Tecumseh said, this is a man, when he shook Brock's hand. And Brock looked at him and said, you are the Alexander of North America, reference to Alexander the Great. What a wonderful story. Those two men made the agreement to create a, a sovereign Indian nation if the war came. 
unfortunately, both died. Brock died in the first significant battle of the war at Queenston Heights, leading a charge. He was impetuous. I actually have a copy of a letter he wrote to his brother here, where he's saying to his brother, I hope I do no rash thing. Well, damn it, he did. He shouldn't have led that charge himself. He should have sent someone, because without the general, they had no leadership. But anyway. Yeah, you bet. Tecumseh was killed in the last year of the war uh, by, uh, by troops led by the later President Harrison. Harrison described meeting Tecumseh in his uh, uh, younger days when he was governor of Ohio Territory. Tecumseh was upset because treaties they'd made about settler, the spread of settlers weren't being kept, and he wanted to see Harrison. He demanded when he met Harrison at his house in Ohio that they meet outdoors. He made uh, he, he, he was quite a clever man and very fluent. He pretended that he was superstitious about discussing treaties under a roof. They sat down on a bench outside the house. Harrison sat down first. Tecumseh sat down right beside him, too close. Harrison inched away. Tecumseh ooched over against him. And while Tecumseh was talking about everything but business, he kept moving towards him in his space. And finally, when Harrison was sitting on the edge of the, of the bench, Tecumseh shoved him off, jumped up and said, now you understand my position. We have nowhere else to go. Stop pushing us. That's and Harrison wrote, yeah. Harrison wrote in his letter to Washington that night to the president, this Tecumseh is a leader such as a people has once in a thousand years. We will have to kill him. My goodness, really. Uh, Harrison claimed to have shot Tecumseh himself, although that's unlikely in 1814 at the Battle of Moravatown. But the truth is that he was killed. His warriors spirited him away so that nobody could claim his body. He's buried somewhere near London, Ontario now. Nobody knows where. And with both guarantors gone, there was no no, no sovereign nation for the First Nations people. Wow, what a great. story. Back to the schooners. There's, there's Tecumseh being launched. She missed the war. She had a sister named Nawash, named after a lesser known chief that the British wanted to honor. And there she is as a historic replica. She's a topsail schooner. She's, as I said, 175 tons. She's got a diesel auxiliary. Her hull is steel. Her spars are fur. And uh, we sailed her all over the Great Lakes for a while. But I have to say that she was not a great ship. One of her captains back in 1815 described her as sailing like a haystack. And uh, <laughs> what that meant in those days was that she was tender and made a hell of a lot of leeway. Yeah. And uh, in the year 2001, just before I left uh, my job there to go and make the movie Master and Commander, we did inclining experiments on her. And we found that actually I'm talking to an audience of sailors here, which is a great relief because I don't have to talk about what stability is. Oh, lay it on us, man. OK, well, we, we did an inclining experiment, which the naval architect then extrapolated to ultimate stability, limit of positive stability and all that deck immersion angle. We found that her limit of positive stability was only 76 degrees. So that meant if she went halfway to a knockdown, she'd keep going. And that's without two 24 pounder guns on her deck. Oh my God. So she was grounded forever. Uh, I have to say she was quite awkward to sail. Uh, she's pretty bluff bowed. Uh, she's pretty beamy, which I guess was a, uh, an attempt by the Royal Navy back then to, uh, to give her enough stability to carry her weapons. Then in those days, of course, her whole reason for being was to carry her two big 24 pounder guns into range of USS Niagara, which the Americans had preserved down in Lake Erie. Well, nowadays, her reason for being is to evangelize history and bring her people home alive. So uh, uh, she, she was grounded and uh, she has not sailed since 2001. That's a wonderful story. This schooner is HMSB. Uh, she's quite small. She's only 30 tons, and she was one of three that the Royal Navy built uh, in 1817, right after the war, at Wasega, which is actually the very place where USS Niagara bombarded the fortress and burned USS, uh, sorry, HMS Nancy, the brig. She's uh, small and light and nimble, and if you start hearing affectionate terms from me, it's because I loved her. Uh, she, actually, I just noticed well, it's the first flag. flag in that picture. Uh, <laughs> we were uh, doing a historic event depicting what might have happened if uh, the War of 1812 had continued and the naval base had been attacked. But uh, at any rate, uh, she, uh, uh, when people ask me what she's like to sail, I always tell them that compared to a modern yacht, she's simply heartbreaking. 
I used to stand beside the helmsman when I was her captain and look forward through the leeward shrouds, four shrouds, and that's the direction we were going. So that's about oh, 50 God, degrees. I feel your control. pain all the time, man. Oh, my well, God. But you got to love them for what they are. And yeah. I, I would always say she would do anything I asked of her as long as I was careful not to ask things I knew she couldn't do. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's a pretty girl. and looks like she can bite. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, uh, she had a, a bronze four-pounder on board, which was my own property. Uh, I got tired of reenactors asking to borrow it all the time, so it's in the local museum now. But yeah, she she spoke with a fair bit of authority. And if if war had come, she would have carried a six pounder amidships, and uh, not much protection for her people, as you can see. Uh, but she was one of three. That's a picture of her sailing on Georgian Bay. Uh, she, uh, I fought and fought and fought trying to convince myself that she had a fore topmast and a fore topsail. Uh, there was one watercolor painting of either her or one of her two sisters entering a river with a four topsail set uh and uh by god i think they would have given her one but in the interests of uh conservative safety uh she never got it so we sailed her as a as a bald-headed schooner it looks like her sail area is a long way aft but i'll retreat one shot yeah you can see how much drag she had in her keel her uh, center of lateral resistance aft was way aft and uh she she actually sailed quite well uh with the uh, the sail plan she's got and actually, in this picture, that's kind of interesting. What I've done here is I've brailed up her foresail to clear the decks for the, for the four-pounder to fire amidships. You can drop that sail again immediately, and away, and away we'd go. And she, was, she was pretty nimble that way. There was uh, some sort of lacing, that braille? Yeah, she had brails. You can see them in this picture. And I'll get that nifty pen going again, Duncan, that you showed me. Yeah. And there it is. I'll make it red. These are the braille lines. I see. And they gather the sail up to the foremast, and you can you you can just yank that sail away and it vanishes. In heavy weather, we'd sail her with just the foresail set and maybe just the uh, just the forestaysail. And with that small rig, she was she was pretty uh, pretty pretty resilient. We had a terrible passage up Lake Huron with her once, uh, and uh, that little schooner never stuck her nose under a wave. She's really apple cheeked which I guess is uh, uh, gave, her, gave her tons of buoyancy up forward. And being a historic vessel, maybe some of your schooners are this way, with all that gear hanging off the ends, fore and aft, uh, she made a pretty rotten motorboat because she, uh, in a head sea, she'd make one, two, three, and just stop. Oh, and we'd have to bear get her going again. So which nobody's going to your skiing. Yeah, there, there was a, which is a problem if you've got to get to, uh, say, uh, Alpina on uh, Lake Huron in time to collect a port visit fee. That's the war she fought uh, in her time. So uh, we changed her over the years that she sailed. She was the replica was launched in 1984, and we uh, she originally had ballast in the form of pigs of lead laid uh, between her timbers uh, uh, and uh, her floors. Uh, during my time as her captain, we we recast her ballast as a shoe and bolted on on outside her. What a difference that made. Not only did it give her another foot of lateral surface fore and aft, it, it increased her writing moment tremendously. And when we did the uh, uh, the uh, stability experiments on her in the same sessions as we did poor Tecumseh, we found that while well, Tecumseh's limit of positive stability was 76 degrees, HMSB's was 112. Yeah, that's better that's than amazing. Most yachts. Oh, yeah. Okay. She, she's stiff and uh, loyal, and I loved her, and I used to stand, actually, that's probably me right there. I used to stand on her quarter deck and have impure thoughts of where I'd take her and what I'd do with her if she was mine, uh, but she belonged to the government of Ontario. Uh, one, thing, one thing I certainly would have done is I would have given her the centerboard that the original had. Why didn't this one have a centerboard? Well, there was no evidence of a centerboard in any documents except the last survey that was done of her by the Royal Navy in 1831 when she was an old girl and she was being put up for auction to be sold out of the service. It transpired that she was so rotten that nobody bid on her, so she's still in the bottom of our harbor. But uh, And Gordon, was, uh, was the B one of the boats that did the survey? Yes, I'm getting to that. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. I'll You're welcome. Through. I'm pushing you along. Right? along. Uh, <laughs> The survey described her centerboard and centerboard trunk much rotted. Well, wouldn't that tell you and I that she had one? 
that did not convince the academic historians, so she didn't get it. So uh, moving forward here to get to the surveying part. Uh, on the left, that's what I how I dressed when the public couldn't see us. And on the right, that's the fearsome Captain Laco. That's how I dressed when we were visible to the public. An interesting thing about my uniform there on the right, that's a captain with less than three years seniority, only one epaulette. Uh, uh, the fearsome Captain Laco. Yes. <laughs> Uh, my wife uh, is a very skilled uh, dressmaker, and uh, people weren't spending $4,000 on ball gowns when I took her to the wilds of Midland here, so she became a very expert maker of historic clothing, and she made that uniform for me and many others. And in that picture, it's hot summertime, you can see a seaman behind me dressed quite lightly. Uh, I am wearing probably seven layers of wool with horsehair stiffening and a flax shirt under it all, and I was comfortable in the <laughs> uh, uh, the uniforms were well designed as protection in the summer if i left it open like that i i would have like uh, uh i could feel my back cool from sweat evaporating there's wads of wool in my armpits which is because of the way it's cut that wicks moisture away from my body in the winter if i closed the coat it was warm in january we don't have clothing like that nowadays unbelievable so here we come to, to the charting and we're getting to the end almost here uh after the U.S. Navy destroyed the base at the mouth of the Nautilusauga River, which is where B and her sisters were built, and they burned the Nancy, the Royal Navy knew they couldn't go back there, so they moved to a place with a horrible long name called Penetanguishing, which is just about 10 kilometers from where I'm sitting right now. That historic site has been rebuilt largely thanks to this watercolor painting done by one of the officer's wives. And the most important thing that base did, besides being a Cold War missile silo of its day, ready for 54 years for a renewed war that never came, it was the base from which the Royal Navy charted the upper Great Lakes. This vessel in the foreground here is the ex-USS Scorpion, renamed Surprise. I actually named my own boat that. And this is one of Lieutenant Henry Bayfield's 38-foot pulling boats in which he charted the whole upper Great Lakes. And this, by the way, is HMSB hauled ashore on the ways. Charts and maps uh, from a military point of view were largely like this uh, in, uh, in, in the interior of North America. Uh, they'd be like a triptych, like the American Auto Association used to send you if you're going on a trip. Travel four miles, look for the build, building, turn right, and so forth. There's a river, follow the river till the waterfalls, go north for 100 yards and so forth. That won't do for navigation. So the Royal Navy sent Lieutenant Henry Bayfield and Midshipman Philip Collins, both of whom had fought through the Great Wars, to Penetanguishene to chart the Upper Great Lakes. Two men with two open boats. They had a tiny budget to hire uh, rowers. They did. And in just a few years, they charted the Great Lakes so specifically that nobody yet has found a significant error in the work they did. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Yeah, it's just Bayfield wrote to die an admiral. Sorry? That's just remarkable. Yeah. He lived to, uh, to be an admiral. He was photographed in 1867, the year Canada became an independent nation. And uh, that's him posing for his photograph. He died shortly after that. But as a young man in his early 20s, he was a lieutenant or a lieutenant, as they call him in the U.S. And he and Collins attacked a monumental task. In my introduction, I commented that I was one of the co-founders of Atlantic Challenge Canada. Coincidentally, those Atlantic Challenge gigs are almost identical to the 38-foot gigs that Bayfield and Collins used to chart the Upper Great Lakes. Is that right? This right. photograph was taken of our two Canadian Atlantic Challenge boats in France a few years ago. But when I look at that photo, I say, my God, that's Bayfield and Collins departing for a season of surveying. They, uh, at this point in my talk, I normally go into a long description of what a sextant is and how you use a sextant to measure angles, but we're all sailors here. So what I'll talk about is surveying in those days, just like it is today, was all about building triangles. Bayfield would start at a point with his chain, like a surveyor's chain, and create a right angle triangle that he had all three corners of within reach. And from that, he would build triangles on triangles on triangles, solving by Pythagoras theorem that we all learned in grade 11 in high school to uh, uh, figure out how far various salient points are from others. This is a uh, actually an American chart of the coast of Maine. 
uh, but you can see there's a mountain they could see, and they used that for charting about 30 miles of coast, because as long as they could see that peak, and they knew from building a triangle earlier where that peak was, they could just keep building triangles and carry on around the around the course, around the, uh, the coast. HMSB uh, was the only healthy one of her three sisters in the years uh, after the war. And they were built of softwood and tended not to last. So this is exactly how she would have looked when she was traveling up and down the coast, meeting Bayfield at various points and bringing him supplies. There were no cell phones and radios, of course, in those days. So what they had to do was imagine where he might be and then go and look for him. They call our coast here the 30,000 islands. There are more. And there were long stretches sometimes when B couldn't find him. And there we have places now where there are very nice, beautiful summer cottages on places called Starvation Bay, which is just north of us. That's a place where for three weeks, Bay, uh, they couldn't find Bayfield and he was reduced to eating seagulls, which he wrote in his diary he didn't like much. Oh, my God. And by the way, just because we're all sailors here, I've uh, got my pen going. That figure there in the white shirt with the buff belt is me. I remember I was standing with my, my uh, right hand on the shrouds. And I was just about to duck to look under the skirt of the foresail, and I was shouting to my mate, and that's him there supervising the, a sheet being adjusted. Who the hell is that jerk dodging around in the motorboat under my lee? Well, it turned out it was my friend Roland who took what became my favorite photograph of HMSB sailing. And yes, we're in a room full of sailors here, so I know that that topping lift should have been eased, but we just tacked and we hadn't eased it yet. We're not going there. It's going to be okay. Okay. So uh, that's me back in the uh, early 1990s, uh, sailing in Northern Georgian Bay on a trip. We found a survey marker ca carved out of a block of white pine, and on it was QC 1820. My God, 1820, is it possible that could be one of, one of Bayfield's survey marks? I was very excited. So I squatted beside it to take a picture. Uh, no, it turned out it was from the 1885 survey done by Captain... Bolton, who was sent in 1885 to check Bayfield's work, he found he could, no errors. He didn't change anything. And in fact, the charts that you use today, if you come up into the northern uh, Canadian waters in the upper Great Lakes, they still sometimes bear Bayfield's name. And there have been no substantial changes other than details added by aerial photography. He was a superman. This is a, a copy of the chart of the region where I live on Southern Georgian Bay uh, from the first uh, chart published of the area by the Royal Navy in 1821. Uh, the naval base is here. Right at this moment, I'm sitting in a house that's right here in Midland, the next town over that wasn't there yet then. But what I want to draw your attention to is something that I think makes my hair stand on end. And as sailors, I think it will maybe do the same for you. Look at these two lines of so soundings here, that one and this one. Those lines of soundings go north from opposite ends of Hope Island, and they go to the Western Islands, which are here. In this part of North America, our predominant winds are northwesterlies. And if Bayfield was in his two boats making soundings by hand as he was going, notice those lines of soundings are curved. I exaggerated that, sorry. They're cur they're both curved. Bayfield knew from taking bearings back on where he'd come from and looking ahead of where he was going that the boats were making leeway and he had to keep heading up as he was running the, running the line. He included the leeway error in his charting. Yeah, it's just remarkable. That was the depth of the integrity that he had. And that's, by the way, that's his depths are all still good and the positions of the islands are all still all still good. And the only thing that's changed is places like this well, look at the detail there. Those dots look like smudges. They're in the right places. And he did yeah. that in just a few years. And he got hell from the Admiralty for, for taking so long. They didn't understand. That's a picture of what that coast looks like that he charted. Uh, we, as I said earlier, we call it the 30,000 Islands. Actually, there are more. And uh, I, find, I think it's one of the finest places in the world to sail. I've lived here since 1989. And there are still bays I discover. On uh, Saturday, after I do a talk uh, at a local uh, marine operation for my business, I'm jumping in my boat. And in three hours, Caroline will be, and I will be in one of those bays that look like no one's ever been there before. If you come and visit us, let me know. I'll be your host.
Oh, it's wonderful. Gordon, what a great There was another great slide. Great. It didn't happen. Oh, no. Too bad. <laughs> well, there it is. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, no. Can you see that? I can. Can you zoom me a little bit? Okay. Well, I, I'm not sure why that turned into a small well, picture. Yeah, but... hit, see if you can hit your play again. Okay. Uh, well, it, it, it basically is just a modern hydrographic chart of the, uh, of the Great Lakes. And at this point, I, I invite you folks to ask questions. And uh, history about navigation, about sailing a historic schooner, and you bet. Sorry, uh, sorry it took so long to get here. Ah, it's just fine. Fascinating. Can, fascinating. can I put myself back on the screen now? Yeah, you can. Yeah, sure. sure. Okay, can you there see me back again? Hey, um, for those of you who have been watching, it's great to have you here. This is the time to type a question into your Q and A box down at the bottom of your screens, or of course you can also. Uh, enter something in the chat, which I'm monitoring as we go. Now, Gordon, I do have one here, which is kind of an interesting question. <laughs> Mr. Anonymous Attendee says, minor point, but I can't corroborate your statement that the American Declaration of War in 1812 specifically stated an intention to conquer Canada. Not in Madison's message to Congress, or in his proclamation of a state of war. Somewhere in between was the war resolution adopted by the House Foreign Relations Committee and then approved by the House and Senate. Maybe it's in there, he asks, but in the fragments that are available online, I can't find any mention of Canada. Admittedly, the possibility was on everybody's mind, but was it actually stated? Woo, that's a long one. Yes, it was. And if you like, I'll find it uh, because I shouldn't make such statements unless I can footnote them. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll stand up to that. I'll, I'll write to you later. Very nice. We're certainly going to look forward to that. Um, now, I did want to ask you a little bit about B, And uh, we saw some wonderful pictures of her as a supply ship. And when you sent the students students out in those two, were they, they weren't shallops or were they? Uh, of the Atlantic Challenge boats, they were gigs. Yeah, the gigs, yeah. yeah. When they sent the students out in the gigs, did they recreate part of uh, the survey uh, path? We did. We did. We stayed in local waters, but we did. We Wonderful. showed them how to use a, a sextant held horizontally to measure islands and take soundings and, and build yeah. the triangles. We, we did. Well, here recently, recently, two or three years ago, we sent a shallop out to uh, recreate John Smith's trip up and down the Chesapeake, which between you and me and, and us girls, I have absolutely no interest in doing because it looked awful, but they really had a wonderful time. <laughs> now, uh, Will Gates, who was uh, captain of Maryland Dove, has written in, did you ever do business with Dunes Twine in Kitchener, Ontario, and are they still in business? Yes, I did, and they're hard to reach now. They've been swallowed by another company, but we do uh, we do sell a lot of twines, and people often say, "Call these guys; they've got what I want." Yeah. So uh, I I can check into that. And by the way, when I was in university, I had a, a picture of the first dove of Maryland on the wall in my room. It was a shot of her close reaching. I thought that was a wonderful uh, picture, and I uh, I didn't have naked women. I had that on my wall. <laughs> that's great. Well, I'm I'm still twisting Will Gates' arm to give us a presentation about Dove. So we're we're looking forward to that. Will, and, I know you're hearing me. And Will, I think we've met probably at the main Bolt Gorillas show. Is that possible? Or, or Mystic? Yep. I used to go every year. And Will Gates types in, close reaching is the best she will do. <laughs> yeah, of course. Oh, must be a scooter. <laughs> oh, no, actually, I'll throw something in there. We, we'd have yachties come aboard at HMSB on our evening sales. Yeah. And I did it for years. Uh, and they, they, they'd assume because we sailed an old fashioned rig, we didn't know how to sail really. So they'd say, Hey, can I show you how to make her sail better? Sure. Yeah. 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 So you they show me how to make them better, but it's an historic vessel, isn't it? Yeah. They crank the sheets in. And sure enough, yeah, we could stick her nose up higher into the wind. And then I'd say, Well, wow, yes, that's quite remarkable. Look at the wake. Yeah. Look how fast <laughs> we're not moving. And 12 degrees <laughs> of leeway now is 25, and we're stopped. Yeah. Oh. Well, I'm going to ask you one more oh, quick question uh, as we go. How on earth did you end up as a Marine consultant for the movies? 
Well, that's a, an interesting story too. I was um, I was working uh, in the marketing department of the historic site uh, now called Discovery Harbor. Then it was called in the early '90s. It was called uh, the Historic Naval and Military Establishments, 1815 to 1856. Oh my Somebody goodness! Trips right on your tongue. They changed the name to Discovery Harbor. Uh, our budgets were being cut dramatically, and I discovered there were these uh, strange tribes of people that. If you fed them and bought them gunpowder, they'd come and stage <laughs> battles on your site. And uh, that led to hosting uh, reenactors, and I became one myself. And that led to getting calls occasionally uh, at the site from people wanting to wanting to film. And I found I had a, a, a knack for being a peacemaker between museum people and movie people. Whoa, that's a talent. Well, for movie for a museum, a good day is a day in which no grass gets bent and no no paint gets touched and That's no door right. gets moved. And, That's exactly uh, right. Movie people show up and they say, okay, well, yeah, I know we contracted to use this building between these hours, but that one looks great. And next thing you know, one of the flunkies has knocked a nail through a 200-year-old door and and so on. So I, 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 I was able to keep peace. And that's an important uh, thing. I started, uh, I reached a point by about 1995 where I was doing uh, documentaries as a sideline steadily. And then one day I was sitting at my desk uh, where I was national sales manager for Transat Marine, which is a company that imported mostly British uh, racing yacht fittings. Yeah. Uh, but because of my captaincy of HMSB, the owner allowed me to bring in traditional gear, which was what I loved. I got a call from uh, the captain of uh, HMS Rose, which I didn't know yet was destined to be in Master and Commander. Correct. Asking to buy a lot of rigging. And oh. I thought to myself, who's doing a Patrick O'Brien film? And it took me months, but I found out who. Uh, they bought the rigging from me uh, to build, uh, to rebuild Rose and build sets for uh, the French frigate and our frigate. I was going to ask you because she looked pretty beaten up in a couple of those uh, scenes. Yeah. And they took me to uh, to uh, to help train the Royal Marines and help train the actors look like officers in the Royal Navy. And at the end of four weeks uh, down in Mexico on the location, I was invited into a meeting with Duncan Henderson, the, who passed away last summer. He, he was the uh, producer and a lifelong friend. We is one of those men you work for and you become good friends. Oh, that's great. And Duncan uh, said to me, what do you think we're going to miss when you're gone? Because I was about to go home. And I said, everyone in the world wants to work on this film. Your departments are getting a blizzard of advice from everywhere, and they're spinning in circles. You need someone who's going to say, this is scene 154, part B, Gord talking to Dun Duncan. I've got a white canvas shirt on. You're wearing a suit. There's this in the room and that in the room, and we've got this kind of watch on. Absolutely. A few options, and stop talking about it once he makes a decision. Move on to the next scene. And he said, would you stay and do it? So they made me the lead technical advisor and my world changed. That is it. That's a wonderful story. I just love it. Hey, my friend Jochen Hoffman is writing in here. He says, great charting work reminds me of the work of Captain Cook as a young man off the Canadian coast. Well, that's something I pound the table, Duncan, and spill people's beer over. He was in, he was in uh, Australia for a few weeks and they own him. He was in Canada for almost 18 years. He learned and, his trade here. Well, we don't even know that. But we don't even know that. Yeah, we, know we don't that. know that. It's uh, he, he was a hell of a man. Oh, that's a wonderful thing. Well, Gordon, we've reached the end of our time. Uh, anyone has any further questions, this is a time to throw them in. And uh, I have to say, this has been just wonderful. And I, I just am in awe of what you've done so far. Thank you for taking the time with us, my friend. And uh, I wish you all the best, and we will loop back on you as time goes by. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Sure, and if anybody's presence. got specific, yeah, to work. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's all good. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us, and Gordon, and the rest of you. This talk will be available on our websites, and uh, I should have it up in 24 hours at the Great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race, that's gcbsr.org, or the American Schooner site, which is amschooner.net. And I'd have a wonderful closeout for you, but tonight we're broadcasting from Panera Bread, and uh, there's no power at my house. So there you go. <laughs>
Gordon, you're a great sport. Thank you, my friend. We'll stay in touch. So long, everybody. Good night, everyone. Take care.